Today's episode of The Real Deal On is brought to you by Guided Hypnotic Meditation. GuidedHypnotic.com. Are you feeling stressed out, overwhelmed, perhaps experiencing night terrors or worse, day terrors? Well, then go ahead to GuidedHypnotic.com and download your free meditation and bust through that anxiety. Sponsored by me. All right. So, oh my gosh. Murray Sawchuk, who is currently headlining the Tropicana Resort and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip nightly, really made his mark on a, as a household name when he exploded onto the entertainment scene with, his, scene with his successful run as a semifinalist on NBC TV's America's Got Talent. The number one network summer series was viewed by over 22 million fans worldwide. Murray dazzled the judges, Piers Morgan, Sharon Osbourne, and Howie Mandel by producing a Ferrari from thin air, transforming a girl locked in a cage into a 450 pound tiger and then a large the largest trick ever on america's got talent by vanishing an entire 1918 steam train locomotive in mere seconds all these illusions took place before a live and national tv audience and brought standing ovations from the judges Murray is one of YouTube's newest sensations with over 1 billion, that's billion with a B, online views. He is a regular guest on the History Channel's Pawn Stars and Magic Expert. He's also been featured on over 200 reality shows from America's Got Talent, Pawn Stars, CW's Masters of Illusion, Sci-Fi's Wizard Wars, VH1's Celebra Cadabra, TLC's Four Houses and What Not to Wear, Reels, Extremes, Escapes. Oh my gosh, dude, you do so much. How do you do all this? <laughs> How you doing, man? I oh my god! All right, at age three, he began swimming and golfing. He learned how to play the accordion, keyboard, and saxophone at five. At age seven, he began to dance lessons that include ballet, Russian, swing, breakdancing, ballroom, etc. He was an avid athlete and enjoyed participating in soccer, baseball, snow skiing, horseback riding, etc. Murray's parents, John and Arlene, presented him with the Sigfield and Roy magic kit when he was seven years old, and his uncle and aunt Bill and Olga gave him a magic gift that changed his life. Murray envisioned himself as an entertainer, incorporating magic, music, and dance in his routines he went to he wanted to perform for audience like his idols dean martin johnny carson lucille ball danny k and phyllis diller as a teen murray had over 21 different jobs from busboy to fixing bicycles and a lifeguard at local pools he continued to entertain folks by dancing playing the accordion and saxophone he continued his studies and received a degree in broadcast communications and journalism when murray was a young man he met marvin and carol roy aka mr electric the couple had toured worldwide for over 50 years and mentioned Murray or mentored Murray while he grew from an accomplished magician into an international star. Murray is the only magician globally who invented a magic act that included manipulation of a multitude of compact discs when he began his professional career called the CD Act. Murray has won over 32 awards for his performances nationally and internationally and received the title of world champion. He has delighted audiences in theaters from Monaco to Paris to Paris to Las Vegas and the legendary Playboy Mansion. Recently, he was honored with four awards, the Hollywood Fame Award for Contribution to Magic on TV, the LA Comedy Award for Best Comedy Show, Top 100 Businessmen of Nevada, and 100 Most Distinguished Men of Nevada. Good Lord, man. How do you do it? I'm just trying to stay busy and keep young, my friend. That's how we do it. Well, you must have one of those uh, paintings in your, uh, in your, your uh, home there because I've known you for good five years, and you seem to be getting younger. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's just the filters I'm using. They're, uh, they're the, uh, you know, over 21, under 35 filter, you know, so uh, I'm good about it. Are, are you a distributor for them? Can we get some of those? I uh, know I should be. Uh, <laughs> a lot cheaper than Botox. So unbelievable uh just a little backstory one of the blessings i've received being a, a speaker you know international speaker traveling the world i get to see most of it from las vegas and that was where we met i was uh speaking at the tropicana uh years ago and you were there and uh just you're phenomenal your show is amazing um and on a side note one of the things i really want to acknowledge about you and, and we'll dig into it is you i believe you genuinely care for the people you work with and that you, you give them, like you give them props, you give them an opportunity. There wasn't like a, hey, it's all about me. It was this, we're in this together. And that was something that really endeared me towards you, the way you supported Lefty and, and you know, things have changed with the, the other uh, experience there. But 
it, it was genuine. I felt it. Like it, it definitely felt like you truly care for the people you are around and the people you are entertaining. I um, do. I do. I think it's important. You know, this, I think it's really, this is Bailey, by the way. So she loves to hang out when we're on camera. <laughs> And I have a bunch of rescue dogs, so I love rescue dogs. But yeah, I think it's really important on uh, giving back and paying it forward and all that stuff. That's how I got to be where I was. You know, my first mentor was a gentleman in Vancouver, Canada named Sean Farquhar. Uh, very, very good magician up there. Creates a lot of stuff. He's on, on Fool Us and all that. And he was my mentor up until my teens, you know. And then uh, he introduced me to a gentleman named Mr. Electric and uh, Marvin Carroll, who's, who you mentioned and you touched on. And... Um, and they, without them, um, I don't think I'd be playing the Las Vegas Strip. Of course, a lot of my mom and dad are super, super supportive, you know, uh, but it's nice to have, of course, the support, but then also it's nice to have people who are really in the business or, or the field that you want to go into that really help you. You know, and somebody taught me years ago, you know, if, oh, everyone's got an opinion. Everyone wants to tell them, tell you whether, how you should make money or lose money. And I said, of course. well, you know, if you want to be rich, and you want to be successful, learn from a millionaire, not a bum on the street or somebody sleeping on their couch that thinks they know what they're doing. Learn from somebody that really has done it and lived it. And I've always um, taken that to heart because I think that's how you learn. So if, now that I'm in a situation with my own show in Las Vegas for years, um, I love the fact that I can help people. Put them on stage, put Vegas on their resume, um, even when maybe they're not ready for Vegas yet or not ready, ready to play on the strip. It's a nice opportunity. It might help them get another corporate gig or help them get a better gig in the city or town where they're from, whether it be Europe or wherever. And I know there's a lot of guys and women that, that do come in my show who are guest acts who are ready for Las Vegas trip, you know, and dear friends, but it, it really helps a lot. And I think it's a nice way to pave the way and help people. That's how I got to where I was, especially when I wasn't even ready, you know, to perform. I was on cruise ship at 19 and 20 wow. years old and I was not ready to headline on a cruise ship with two different 45 minute shows, but there were people that liked me and thought I would get better. And hopefully I have over the last 30 years, but I think it's important. You know, you, you gotta do that. It's good karma, you know? Well, I, I mean, I love that. And um, the fact that you have those other people, have you also had the opportunity to maybe learn some other cool uh, devices, tricks, um, ways to grow your business by doing so that you guys kind of collaborate and have fun sort of sharing your, um, your energies. Yeah, of course. It's always fun sitting around with a bunch of entertainers and magicians or singers or dancers or whoever it is, because we're in this business that is very small. Like, you know, it's like if you're a lawyer or a chiropractor, marine biologist, doctor, whatever the heck it is, it becomes a very small world when you realize, you know, that type of interest in that is, is a pretty small community, no matter what size it is, you know? So like right now I'm sitting here in my hotel room talking to you, um, because we just did a staycation for about three days in a town called Laughlin. It's an hour away from Vegas on the Colorado River. It's beautiful. Um, and so we got a bunch of friends hanging uh, this, this week with us, you know, and they're all entertainers from Vegas. We're not working right now. We have an opportunity to hang out like this. We usually don't. We're usually working right. late, sleeping in, and, you know, we're lucky we get a dinner together once every four or five months. A dear friend of mine here is Michael Grimm. He won American Got Talent in 2010 with his wife, Lucy. And another buddy of mine uh, is Tape Face with his uh, girlfriend, Christina. Uh, so they're coming in, and then there's a bunch of dancers from all sorts of shows in Vegas, from Chip Nails to my girlfriend, Danny, who's the host of Crazy Girls, and a lot of her cast. So it's nice just to hang out with all these people and catch up and talk shop. You know, and we also have a good gossip, too, because we're only human. So, you know, right. <laughs> you know we all do. So I... I... I, I, I don't even dabble in magic. I love it. And I do use a couple in, in uh, you know, when I speak and stuff as a couple of devices I use. But um, one of the things that and I don't know if you experienced this or how did you deal with it? When you started to learn the, the, how the hot dog was made, um, mm -hmm. how, what was your relationship with that experience? And I, and I guess I'm speaking towards how do you keep that, uh, the magical feeling about magic when you kind of know how it's all done. I think, I think the main thing with that is um, I like hot dogs, you know, so that's, that's the big main thing on that, you know, yeah, I guess I, I appreciate the process. And yeah, when you take the veil down and open the curtains and see what really is behind that world and the business, I don't care what business you're in. There's always good, bad, and different, you know? And so I mean, people always, it's funny. We're, we're staying at a casino here. And uh, people always go, oh my God, do you gamble? You know, I, I really don't gamble. 
But my line always is, yeah, I've gambled all my life. I took magic on as a career. I mean, that is right down there by juggler and clown. I mean, it's not, you know what I mean? Like if I really, I'm just making an easy living, I could have went into, you know, marine biology, a chiropractor, being a firefighter, all the things I, I, I enjoyed as well growing up that I thought I would want to do, you know? So, um, so I, I think you have to enjoy and, and love what you do because the thing is when you don't enjoy and love what you do, which is most of America, because they're just working to make the money so they can go on their boat or go on a vacation or spend time with their children or their animals or whatever, they go, go camping. Um, I, most people, like I said, work 50 weeks a year and take two weeks off, you know what I mean? And I'm lucky because I basically take 52 weeks off a year because I love what I do, you know? Right. Um, so that's, and that's, that's a saying from my mentor, Marvin Roy, you know, a lot of work. And uh, there's no degree program and there's no guarantee of any salary. But also, there's no cap on it either. So, right. um, and also the passion. So, there's months you make no money. There's other months you make more money than the other green book. So, so when you're you're at a casino or something like that, do you go to other people's shows? And when you go, are you going as like a wide-eyed child enjoying it, or is there a part of you that's kind of unpacking what's happening? It's both. It's both. I think depending where you are and how many glasses of wine I've had, <laughs> you know. <Right>. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, uh, there's times where you, you get critical. Uh, if it's in my business, it's hard not to watch a magician and not be critical uh, because it's our business. You just naturally go into that mood. But then there's other times where you just go in and go, I want a great, great time. Like me and my girlfriend, Danny, were here last time. We had a great time. And I love seeing shows, you know, any kind of show, good, bad, and indifferent. I love entertainment. And I think last time we were here, we saw a, Be a Beach Boys tribute band here at the Riverside in Laughlin. And we had a great time, bought tickets. You know, and then went, had a couple of drinks. We actually sat at a table with a little old man named Bob, and he was a veteran, and I think he was in his early 80s. Super great guy. I believe he lost his wife a few years before that. And and he even offered us a ticket to sit with him. So we only had to buy one ticket, and so wow. we did. And we bought him a round of drinks, and a uh, super sweet man. And he loved it, of course, because the Beach Boys were his era, you know, right. and he really had a nice, and they weren't the real Beach Boys, but they looked great, and everyone there enjoyed it. And then we gave him our numbers, and then sure enough, he came to see my show, a year and a half ago or so, and then he went to see Danny's show, Crazy Girls, and uh, it was just fun. I, I just love people. I love experiences, you know. And when I don't love people, I just stay in my room, wear a hat, and avoid everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I stand out like a sore thumb. But but I, I'm in a business where I do like people and interactions, and I just find all that interesting, you know. So. And, and one of the things also that I, I you already touched on is the that melding of doing what you love and monetizing it. And one of the things that I recall, even when I first saw you, you talked about how much you loved the marketing aspect of it. Uh, and that was one of the things you were enamored by Houdini. Um, how, it's such an interesting conversation around the whole marketing conversation because what Houdini was doing as marketing back then, how were you able to translate and take some of his uh, philosophies, his mindsets to now where technology and everything is so much different. Um, were you well, able you know, to do so? With Houdini, yeah, of course. We, you know, we have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, MySpace back in the day, which started kind of it all in that sense of social media. Um, but, you know, people don't realize, or some people do, but Houdini was an amazing escape artist, very talented magician, and he created some of the coolest tricks and escapes in the world. But his biggest... Uh, thing that, that he had going for him is marketing. He was one of the greatest marketers in the world. He said he was the best, almost like Michael Jackson, the king of pop, you know, mm -hmm. the king of all media, which is what Howard Stern or whatever it yep. is, you know, is saying. And everyone, you start coining it yourself because if you're good enough or you can step up to the plate to at least hit that ball far enough for people to believe that you are a baseball player, then, then tell people you're a baseball player as long as you own up to it and, and meet that requirement. If you can't, then you're in for a bit of a challenge. But <laughs> If you can do that, it's, you know, because at the end of the day, you got, you've got to survive. You have to market yourself. And, you know, if you go into Vegas or Brent, Missouri, New York City, Chicago, any place that has shows, you know, and every show is the best. Everyone's won the best award. Well, yeah, you right. know, you can buy a lot of awards to say you're the best. Or, you know, my mom said I was the best, so, you know, I'll put that up there, you know. <laughs> so it's it's subjective, isn't it, you know. So with Houdini, he was the same way. He was also great. When he did his spectacles, the only form of publicity really was posters. And then newspapers, you know, newspapers were, were, were the internet. What it was Google, you know, and, and a yellow pages book to find phone numbers. And he would actually do his escapes uh, and hang over, you know, buildings and stuff, but he'd make sure he was hanging right in front of the Chicago Tribune, you know, right. the San Francisco yeah. Chronicle, you know, 
uh, because they're, you're writing well, what I'm going to write about today. And then you look out the window, there's a guy hanging, you know, <laughs> from his Easy rear pickings. end out the window. Yeah. You're know, like, oh, my God, I think that's your day. You know, let's write about that. And so he bet, basically fed right in, and then he'd, block, he'd stop the street and make sure he did it in the middle of Times Square. Really tra- high traffic people. The same as what we do online now. We try mm-hmm. to find and collaborate with the biggest collaborators, the ones that have the biggest followings, the ones that have all this stuff. And and collaborate and that's what he did you know what i mean and that's that's how he he did a lot of what he did and became who he was uh and i've always told people i'm 90 percent, you know pr and 10 percent talent you know uh because <laughs> you definitely need, people need to know who you are you know and, and a lot of people you know, i go to shows and people say oh britney spears isn't a good singer and and there's other people that aren't great singers and i said yeah but but she had, they have the whole package madonna's not the greatest singer either you know what i mean um but but they get a whole package they have looks their personality, they do have talent, they can do it all. And that's, that's really, if you want to be successful, you need the whole package to be commercial. And I know art, art, artists don't like that so much, uh, but even some like Andy Warhol were very artistic, but then he had to be very commercial as well. You know, and that's how he became, you know, a pop cultural figure, you know. So. That's such a, a challenge for some um, because they're so focused on their talent on their artistry and that's where their passion is the the marketing side often becomes sort of second fiddle um whereas you've clearly you know i believe your your talent is you know still more than 10 percent um one of the things when i when i left working with tony robbins i was around with 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 tony for almost you know four years and when i left he's like all right doug this is great remember you are not a trainer you are not a speaker you are not a coach you are not an author you are a marketer of your coaching, speaking, training, and writing. Yeah. And that, I mean, Tony, arguably the biggest guy in personal development, um, certainly yeah. extraordinarily talented. And at the same time, he has always had that marketing hat on. And I think it's instructive and I think it's powerful that you share that because it's true for everything. Um, and you know, you've maintained a tremendous career because you've been able to be on the cutting edge of marketing. I don't think there's any, I mean, a billion views on YouTube is, you know, pretty unheard of. It's not bad. Yeah. You know, it's not bad. I mean, once again, you got to learn things when you don't want to learn them, you know, like, you know, I'm not 20 anymore. So, but I also realized you got to change with the times. So I try to bite my tongue and go, all right, well, let's do this. Oh, okay. Skinny jeans are in. I'll wear these skinny jeans, even though I (laughs) do not feel comfortable in you know, or I'll wear this hat sideways or I'll, you know, wear clothing that I think looks ridiculous. But I, if I, you know, if I can carry it and I still got the body to wear it, I'll try it. Why not? You know, to look the part. And that, that's how you evolve. That's how you don't feel comfortable. I think the biggest thing of being successful is taking that risk and being uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable, then it's not new to you. So you're not learning much, you know. So I've always felt that way about things. So it's and how did you figure out? Different those things, those changes, do you have uh, trusted advisors or are you experimenting well, it helps, as well? It helps with a lot of people. A lot of my friends are half my age, which helps, you know, my, my girlfriend's 10, 11 years younger than me. You know, she's way more trendy. She likes different music. She likes different things. You know, she has more patience for things, you know? <laughs> um, and, and then there's this other side of me where I've tripped and falls a lot. So I can share other things going, Oh, watch that. That speed bump is going to trip you. And then, then they go oh, either. Yes, it is. Or they'll trip on and go, oh, you're right. I did trip on that. So it's just a thing of age, right. And experience. So, but you know, the way to stay relevant is to stay youthful. Why is Dolly Parton still selling out 5,000 seat arenas and theaters? Why is Madonna still doing? Why is U2, Bono, Aerosmith? They've learned to change with the times. One of the best things that Aerosmith ever did the rock and roll band, if you don't know who I'm talking about, um, is did that collaboration with Run DMC in the 80s mm-hmm. and the late 80s, you know, with their old song. And that that brought them back to being cool again, you know. And, and now there's a big, you know, revival of all the old classic rock bands because all, all, you know, all of us who are, you know, my friends who are parents, they want to take their kids to the music that they grew up on to have right. that moment. So now it's become a whole, you know, you know re- rebirth of it all. So, yeah, I think it's really important being relevant and being honest. And look in the mirror you know, and go, who really am I? And what am I selling? And would I buy what I'm selling? You know what I mean? Because if you wouldn't buy what you're selling, then how the hell is someone else going to buy it? You know? Fair enough. Uh, so when, you know, we, we cut to sort of the last few months when the whole lockdown thing happened, what went through uh, your guys' minds? Like, what were you thinking? What were, were you already ready to 
like you had something in the works that you're like, okay, cool. This is the time to focus on that. How, how did you adjust? Well, you know, once we got the news, we started coming for a couple of weeks before and, you know, shows were slowing down and people were slowing down and countries were being, you know, cut down on flights and coming into to the United States and all that. I instantly, you know, I'm also the type when I see the boat starting to fill with water, you know, I don't think about it. I, you know, I start figuring out how to plug the hole before I start bailing water out. So if I can stop the bleeding, I can get the water out once, you know, once the hole's plugged. So I right. look for the source right away and I work backwards a lot of the times versus just deal with the surface and then you never get to the root of it. So with this, I thought, oh, oh, and instantly I, I went in to producing uh, YouTube videos, basically three to five a week, you know, and I had my girlfriend, Danny, film for me because we we're in quarantine. We lived together. So she became my biographer. We uploaded to my editor in LA. And so we basically concentrated on all that because that was not shut down. It was still right. in. And for us, it's monetary as well. It's a business for us. And then we started doing more TikToks. You know, she started doing TikToks as well. So you start tr taking that energy that you'd use on stage or live shows or whatever, and you you flip it into the, something that is um, proactive. And uh, it doesn't it has to always be monetary because uh, you want to keep that train moving. Because once the train stops, it's a lot harder to start it than it's already moving. Once it's already moving, keep pushing it, you know. So that's the type of person I am. Though. As soon as I see the avalanche, start to come you know what i mean i don't run down i run to the left and hope it's clear and let it go past me right trapped in it and as it goes past me i analyze it and look at it and go well how can i jump on this thing and uh, make it successful because it's being crumbled by it so that's just always the way i look at things well I th yeah i think it's so brilliant and elegant right because most people when these things happen when we're kind of disrupted for lack of a better word, not to overuse that word because it's being overused with, you know, between Uber and Airbnb and all of that. But you, but that, that mindset of keeping going right, by, if you, if you stop momentum, you know, sit, physics get in the way, right? So things at rest tend to stay at rest. And it's very easy to then run that new pattern of resting on your laurels and, and doing nothing. And just to keep your mind active by doing something like you shared, if it's not about money, I mean, it's nice that it, it, there may be that part in it, but if if it's at least keeping you active and keeping you focused, that's when new opportunities come your way because you're you're taking action. Hundred uh, percent. You know, I wish people. I learned this at a young age. But I wish I were were learned even younger. When I meet young people and you know in their teens or whatever, they want to be successful. Um, you know, I go, yeah, great, get an education, all that, but shake some hands, meet people, go out and have a conversation, go to a party, because if somebody likes you um, and they like who you are, um, there's opportunities there that they may want to hire you for your for their business. You know, okay, you may not be the president right away, but they may need a janitor, they may need a front desk person, they may need someone below the manager and a gopher, and if you work your way up and, and you enjoy it and you're a good person, you will become the president of that country, co uh, company one day if you play it right or of your own because you'll learn from it. Or it may not be a field you want to go into, but it'll add to that resume and you'll make a friend and someone that'll be a good person to vouch for you when you get the next job or an opportunity. You know, and I always tell people, never ever talk bad to the secretary because usually 20 years later, the secretary ends up owning the company. Right. She's got all the phone numbers, all the black book of all the emails of everybody. And she's the one or he's the one who really knows how to run that company because they've spent the 20 years in the front lines and met everybody. And then all of a sudden, uh, it's your turn to go back into that meeting at ABC or Disney or wherever, and you walk in and you realize um, you can't get a meeting because you're a pain in the ass to the secretary who is now the vice president or CEO, you know? So. Totally. Um, and, and actually, I, I know you live that because uh, I have seen you the way, the way you treat everybody. You're, you have tons of integrity and, and love for people. And you, you are like one of the hardest working guys out there because I remember last time I was, I don't know if it was the last time I was out there, but every time I go there, I do my best to go to one of your shows and I bring whomever I'm with. I say, hey, yeah, you know, we got a kid. But I remember one day we went and saw you and we went to a matinee show because we had some dinner plans and all that. We went back to our hotel and there was some big event going on. You walked in and were like greeting them and pressing the flesh and, and whatever. You took off and then I don't remember what other place we went to, but it was another, you know, hoopla. And there you were right there meeting and greeting and, and just like you were kind of omnipresent as a human. Like you literally were in multiple places throughout the, yeah. the day. Um, yeah. And I love that though. You know, that's, I love the business. I mean, I think Siegfried and Roy said this. Siegfried said it. I know he said it. 
um, you know, with their, you know, they were larger than life, you know, and, uh, but they, they felt when they left, they became such a brand and they were such big stars, kind of like Tina Turner, when she does the hair up or puts the wig on or whatever you want to call it, or Madonna goes out or Dolly Parton or whatever. Uh, they are the show. They branded themselves so much of who they are. I always call it the Ronald McDonald factor. You know, Ronald McDonald could not walk down a busy street without being attacked just like santa claus you know what i mean yep. um because they stand out so much so i always feel like when you do have a brand or you stand out that much the minute you walk out your door that's when the show begins not you don't need curtains or stage uh, that you know um and yeah there's days you have a migraine headache you don't feel like meeting people but it's a public um format that you that i'm in you know that we're in and i think it's important because uh that's what you do if you don't, if you don't want to be recognized then be an accountant, you know, they're very right. intelligent. They go to, to work, save people a lot of money, hopefully, and make a lot of money. And they, you don't need to look pretty. You don't need to, you know, have hair. You don't need to be skinny. You don't need to be fat. You can do whatever you want to do, you know. Um, in entertainment, that's part of it. You know, you are public, especially in this day and age. You know, now yeah. we have the internet and camera phones and all this stuff. Uh, you can't, you really can't get away from it sometimes. So you do have to be aware. And I think in the business, when you walk out that door, the show starts then, not when you get to the theater, it's when you walk out your door, you know? And if you don't want that, then hide or don't make a big deal about it. You know, but if you're standing out and you're looking like you, uh, then you should be nice to people. Even if you're feeling like crap, um, they don't know that, you know what I mean? Right. And they're the ones that pay your mortgage, you know, and help you and help you be successful, you know? So, so I think you really got to remember that, you know, even those days where you wake up or you've had a argument with somebody or you're not loving life so much, you know, cause we all have those days. Um, be nice because they're, they don't know that side of you and that's not really what you want to sell, you know? So what do you do? Like, you know, me, all, all personal development, that's my, my, you know, main focus is learning from people. Like there are days when perhaps, or moments when you're not feeling so excited to be present with someone or do a show or whatever. How do you change your state? How do you create the ideal Murray to be present for uh, whatever situation you're in? I think you need to just be strict on yourself and look at yourself as a third person, stand out and look at yourself and go, is this really who I want to be acting like? I mean, I've been on the phone yelling at people at times because, you know, I'm far from innocent, you know, and I'll, and I'll see somebody, somebody behind me waiting for, for a photo or it's a kid or a family and I'll be losing it. You know what I mean? And but then all of a sudden that but that's not my problem over there. My problem's on the phone with somebody because something's not right. The flight's been canceled right. or somebody screwed up. And I'll just put the phone down, take two seconds, and, go, and then instantly just drop it. Just drop and you know because all they want is the photograph, and I want to look good in the photo for them because they're probably posted somewhere. And meanwhile, inside behind the hair and the glasses, I'm still losing it. But it has <laughs> nothing to do with them. But I want to make sure that moment that they meet me, that they have that for a long time because a lot of people say don't meet your heroes because um, you know, they're paying the ass. And it's a lot of, a lot of truth in that. You know what I mean? Um, and a lot of it's because a lot of these entertainers started young or they have a lot of handlers that just tell them what to do. Mm. So when they are cranky or not nice, um, they, they're allowed to act like that. You know what I mean? Um, because they never had to necessarily always work from the ground up to where they are now, or they've forgotten. And, and for me, I've always, I didn't miss one step getting to where I am. I did everything, you know, from, you know, wash dishes to bus tables to fix bikes to telemarket to all that crap. I even performed in someone else's underneath someone else's name in Korea at the time because I needed the money and I wanted to work, you know, and all that stuff. But I've done every step. So it doesn't matter who I meet, I've done their job or I've done that that level of job and I have that respect for it. So so I always kind of remember all that stuff, you know, and just be with it. It's just, but but I can do that quickly. I can switch gears pretty quickly just because um I don't want that person to be affected like that. You know what I mean? I see a lot of people right. have an argument and they walk on stage. You can tell they're not happy. Well, yeah. that's not the audience's problem. You're not paying for that. Leave that off stage, you know? And it's right. not always easy to do for a lot of people, but there's, you know, I've kind of figured out a way to do that and you just transfer your energy from anger to happiness or to that, put that focus over there on something else. You know what I mean? So. Well, and I love how you, you, go kind of meta, you go third party, you look at, is this, is this how I want to be seen? I'm going to take this picture with this family or this, you know, this person who, you know, loved the show and I don't want to leave them with the, the bad taste in their mouth because then they're going to go, oh, that show sucked. And you could have the best show and then been turned off and that moment could ruin it. Um, and also it's interesting, I think you're right. I mean, I'm in my world, in, first in music and then other areas, like knowing celebrities, a lot of them can be sometimes insulated 
So there is nobody. They're not grounded. They're not kind of going, hey, you know, you're, that wasn't cool. Like, that's right. They get yes, man. Oh, I know. That was effed up. How could that per-? You know, whatever. And, and they don't, there's a lack of reality. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of times where you do lose it and people see well, that. We're human. And, yeah. You know, and I always have a laugh at that. And I go, wow, that was ridiculous. Man, I would hate to see myself at that moment. I've had those <laughs> moments because I do. You know, yeah. it's only human, you know, and, uh, and, or somebody's seen that, you know. And then when I meet them, I go, sorry about that. You know what I mean? Apologize, just, you know, and then we'll get a photo or whatever the case is. Cause you know, you can't always hide, you know, so it happens, you know, but that's, that's life, you know, but you just gotta, the key is to own up to it, be transparent and be honest. And that's it. You know what I mean? If you want to, you know, if you bullshit too much or be fake, people can see through that. You know they what can mean? catch on, especially now people have become pretty sensitive. Cool. Um, so how long were you, you shared all the jobs. I'm, I'm assuming you like every other, uh, success story had years of challenges um you were i assume some of the the jobs that you had those were your quote day jobs while you were still developing yourself as a magician comedian performer um what was that transition like and and have you ever had a moment of like or had you ever had a moment of like, oh, I got to give up. Like, I can't, I can't do sure. it anymore. Yeah, every year I go, you know what? I should get a job at Home Depot or Starbucks. I don't know why we stay those two places. But I, I think because they have a good medical plan. But, um, okay. <laughs> and I like, I like building stuff and I love coffee. So that's probably the reason. But um, yeah, yeah, every year or two you have those, I think. There's those days where you go, man, this is hard. But I think in any business, it's hard if you're trying to be the best in it and the owner and the top of the game. Like, I'm just that personality where I don't care who I work for. I always wanted to own the company. I always wanted right. to be the president. That was just me. I, but I knew I had to learn how to stock shelves or what all the products were before I could own the company. So I've always been that way with everything. Like I've always, you know, I've never wanted to be the renter. I always want to be the owner. You know what I mean? And I've always been that way for everything. Um, so every time if I worked for somebody, I thought, I don't know why I'm working here, making that person and their company more popular when I could be doing it for myself, you know, and I've just, I've always had that since I was a kid, since I was 12 years old when I first had my first job, you know, making um, meat pie shells at a bakery after school, I'd ride my bike up there and do it for two or three hours, listen to my yeah. Sony Walkman at the time, dating myself with a cassette yeah. player and <laughs> all that stuff. I remember when the song Kokomo came up by Beach Boys, that, because I was, I love that song, I always play it when I was working when I was 12, which is years ago, and um, so every time I did stuff like that, it was always the reason I worked there was to make more money, to buy magic, to buy, you know, to learn, educate myself more. And, and every time I had, like I said, I had 19 different jobs between 12 and, and I guess age 20 or 19. And every time employers would walk down and go see my resume, it was two or three pages long. Like, well, why did you spend only six months of this job or five months? I said, well, they paid me, you know, $8.92 $8 an hour. And that job paid me 10 52 and you're offering me $12 and 30 cents an hour. That's why I like money and I'm working for money and I want money. And that's why I'm here. I said, I don't necessarily love cooking fish and chips, I said, right. but you offer a good salary. I'm a good worker. I'll do the job for you. I might be here six months. I might be here six years. I said, but I even buy the company off you. I said, but that's why I'm here. I said, I'm not trying to fool you or me, um, but uh, you're paying 12 bucks an hour. So you're going to get me for as long as I can keep the job until I until find I job. find one that offers me thirteen, and I'll give you an opportunity exactly. to match it. <laughs> yeah, and I said it to all my employers, and I shocked some of them by that. I said, "Are oh, you really honest?" I said, "Well, why do you work, and why why did you decide to own a place instead of go still work at McDonald's? You know, because you wanted to have a nicer home. You wanted to put your kids in private school. Mm -hmm. you know? And when you talk to somebody like that, they go, "Wow, okay, you know." And so that's just the person I was, and I'm sure I lost a few jobs with that attitude. But, um, but that was the reason I wasn't lying. I wanted money. I like money, you know, so still do. So, <laughs> so when you transitioned to full-time entertainer, was that the cruise ship job? And then it yeah, was, it was. Kinda... yeah, yeah. I, I've been doing kids birthday parties since the age of 12 years old. And I had a yellow pages ad a business line in my bedroom and I booked other acts out that I, I couldn't do. I didn't want to give them away. So I thought, well, I became a, a, a manager. Yeah, I take 10 or 15% off. Yeah. And I, and I, then I hired, balloon twisters and face painters uh, out of my company and I'd hire them and take 10% off of that and make a few extra bucks. And so that developed. And then I got the offer for a cruise ship when I was 19, 20 years old and uh, I offered a two month contract and I somehow bullshitted my way on to staying longer to staying for seven months. And I extended the contract five times, you know, and that's when I knew that's what I was going to do. 
because I gave up all my contacts on land. I was a lifeguard for years at pools. I loved lifeguarding, and that paid well, and I liked it. It kept me in shape, and I loved the water. Um, and it paid really well, but but this was something I could do for the rest of my life. So I always had two or three jobs and did magic. I was always working. So this is the first time I called all my other jobs and part-time jobs saying, guys, I'm, I'm taking off. You know, this is it. I'm, I hope this works. I only have one job now, not two or three, because I always had two or three checks coming in. Not a lot of money, but, you know, I was right. a bus boy here, and I had a paper, paper route here and fixing bikes over here for a company. So that's kind of always, always had diversified my money and my time. So if something goes south like this quarantine, I'm not stranded uh, like right. most the world is. I have a few more outlets, you know what I mean? So I can still, you know, buy ramen and a piece of bread and have dinner. You know? <laughs> well, so I see you've continued that mindset by having multiple streams of income and inspiration and, and support. Uh, what were some of your, like, you got into illusions. You, your first thing, obviously, you know, all magic is illusion, but not like large scale. Uh, the when did you start getting into those larger scale things? Was was that early in your career, or were you doing close up magic and then moved into the the bigger stuff? Yeah, well, it varied. I mean, I when I was a kid, I bought a couple of big tricks where you cut somebody in half. It's called the zigzag box. And I bought it at a magic auction. Some guy built it, and I think I bought it for five hundred bucks or something like that. And I bought a couple other props, but they were you know, self-made type things, not from the big builders that all the big magicians at that time were using because I couldn't afford it. And I learned that I'd do the odd thing and then I'd charge more money if I wanted, somebody wanted me to produce a CEO at a corporate show or something like that, I'd charge extra 500 bucks for it, you know? And I thought, oh, this is a great markup, I own it. And it's yeah. only two minutes, but it's a big prop so I can mark up a little bit and, you know, add a sale, you know? Uh, and I thought, well, this, this is the way to go for a little bit. And, uh, and so when I did cruise ships and I'd always had two or three big illusions, but I never wanted tons because my problem was having the overhead. I didn't want a place I had to rent to keep my props. Cause now oh, yeah. you know, I'm losing money by holding onto the props. If I'm not using them that often. So I didn't do a lot of shows with big props. So I thought, well, let me pick two or three. And I know work that I love that I can do anywhere. that will always work. And in my own warehouse and garage, which doesn't cost me anything. And the rest, if I really want to do them, I'll get them built for the client or for the TV show, or I'll rent them. There's a ton of magicians not working. Um, and there's a ton of magicians that buy this stuff that, that basically depreciate worse than, you know, buying a Jaguar. And um, and basically I'll rent it off them, you know what I mean? And, and then create the show. Like when I did America's Got Talent, which I managed the steam train, which is the largest trick they'd ever done on the show, even to this date, um, every, those four, episodes I did, those tricks I'd never done before because I, I designed them for what I thought the producers would like to see and Damn. commercially what that program and people would like to see. I had some great tricks, but I knew it wouldn't go very well or wouldn't go far for that format. And that's how I don't think people always become that successful in the show because they do what they want to do. As an artist, they don't really do what is best for the show or for them on that format of the show, you know? So yeah, so all those tricks I did and designed and then um, I gave them back to everybody because now one I rented one off somebody rented another and I rented a tiger and then I got them to you know make a train for me and all this stuff so I, I everything was created uh, for the moment and that's what I do with a lot of things I kind of assess the situation and then feel what's the best for it then create it design it and then uh, hopefully it works you know so I like which goes back to your brilliance of marketing where you yeah. you're looking at the what people are going to want um, which is beautiful. Yeah. Um, were you always funny? Like when you grew up, was comedy always a uh, something that um, was natural yeah. for you, or you always were a prankster? I loved to laugh. You know, my dad uh, would, had a great sense of humor. You know what I mean? He was always doing a joke, or he'd make some wasn't well, necessarily that funny, but he would always had that sense of humor. My mother as well always had a good laugh. My mom, you know, when somebody found something really funny. She type that would start laughing and then you just couldn't stop laughing, you know, because once you start laughing, all of a sudden you both start and then you just can't. Now you don't know what you're laughing about because you're laughing at the laughing. Right. And that was my mother's side, you know, because uh, I, I we'd find all sorts of things funny. You know, if somebody trips or falls, this is the worst. But God damn, that is so funny. Um, <laughs> even when I fall, I laugh. I go, man, I'm looking like, you know, a giraffe going down a set of stairs, you know. But um, well, my dad always was, was it would have a joke or he'd have different you know things that you find funny or you always had an opinion you know so that's kind of where my sense of humor uh, came from I think and then I actually learned how to become funny I always look at things in a funny way I always loved being funny I see funny like most people or comedians 
you just see something, you don't, you see it five different ways, you know, yeah. instead of just what it is. It's that's the way you think, I think, as a live performer, especially I'm, I'm used to doing a lot of improv on stage. So when I look somebody and they walk in wearing, you know, a Hawaiian shirt and flip flops, you just cannot not make a joke about <laughs> either <clears throat> Jimmy Buffett or Fear and Loathing or whatever the hell it is. They're wearing sandals, you can make a Jesus joke, you know. Yeah. So instantly you go right into it and you have this Rolodex of lines you've used for years. Uh, when you see somebody look at different, or somebody wears a safari hat, you know, you go, oh my God, Indiana Jones, thanks for being here. It's so nice to meet you. you know, whatever it is, you just, but that's, that's a live performer for you, a comedian. You know, I've always looked at things that way. And I, I look funny, you know what I mean? And and I design myself after like How, Howard Stern and Lucille Ball and Phyllis Diller, people I, right, that Liberace, you know, that are iconic the minute they walk into a room, you know, so just kind of, you know, took, learned from the old pros, you know, and added a few things of my own. For sure. I appreciate that. In your shows, you are also, you don't take yourself too seriously. Like you're, you're definitely poking fun at yourself and, and it's uh, in, in a nice way, not in a self-deprecating yeah. way, but like, you're, you're just real, like, Hey, you know, it's, it's, That's right. I'm not, <laughs> not yeah. trying to make a, a joke about it. It just, it's funny. Yeah. Well, my opening line is I walk out and I know what people think. Cause I get people coming to me going, Oh my God, you're a choreographer or a hairdresser. And I'm not, and I'll, so my first line when I walk out, I go, I don't know what you think, but no, I'm, I'm not gay. My hair is, I'm yeah. not. <laughs> and then I have my stage deck, who's a big New Yorker kind of guy, and come on and take something off. You know, and as he walks off, I go see him back in the room. So people go, oh, wait a minute, is he gay? Is he straight? And I like that <laughs> because I don't want people to know. It's not important. It's just for a joke. It's just a laugh, you know. Right. So, and I, and I want to say what people assume, you know, especially in the Midwest. In the middle, I walk into a bar and. Oklahoma or Texas looking like this and it's uh you know they're already judging you that's just the way the world is they're not used to seeing something looks like a backstreet boy you know so. totally so one of the things uh, I didn't know if I noticed this you know moving to that a little bit you know you have a residency but now that that's shut down have you started to do any shows in areas that are open well not yeah I have fall bookings you know to tour a little bit in Canada and and the states you know and Hopefully we'll go back in Vegas, middle of July. I know I just found out the Tropicana, I believe, is going to open up uh, September 1st. So we may go back uh, the long weekend in September there. Um, but everyone's opening up their own pace. Yeah. I know I just did a show this last week, four days ago, at a drive-in. Uh, Tickle Me Comedy, a buddy of mine owns that. It's a comedy club here in Vegas and a brand. And they decided to do uh, three shows um, at a drive-in. And basically, it's a drive-in type theater, which is a back of a warehouse they designed, put lighting up, and it's probably about 35 cars and probably 80 people in total. There's certain people that sit in picnic tables there and everything. And we it was it's like 105 degrees out. I wore a leather jacket because he had to look good. He had to look the part, but I almost died. And I only did seven, eight minutes. My God, it was hot. But I wanted to do it. I wanted to experience it. I wanted to be relevant, and I wanted a story. So when I'm 80 and I look back, and people go, when we're all sitting around, go, what's the craziest thing you've ever done, you know, um, for shows? And it'll, it'll be one of those. You know, when the world fell, I didn't want to start working, so I went into a show to drive it. Yeah, who does that? You know, but Brad Paisley's doing a big show in Nashville. Yeah. At, at a drive-in, you know, in a big field. I mean, I think... I think this, Garth Brooks just did one, too. That's my friend yeah. David, because I, I was talking to Shane, and you saw before, my friend Shane Keister is, like, iconic musician yeah. in Nashville. And, and uh, yeah, it was, um, they're, they're figuring out ways. That's right. right. Well, that's how you survive. That's how you stay in the game or you fold and right. you let it become you, which is fine too. People all have their way of coping and dealing. Um, but I think we're going to lose a lot of entertainers and people in this biz uh, who, who have a shot at it because of this, because you got to pay your bills, you know? And I also think there's going to be a lot of people that are coming out of this that, that uh, will become entertainers and influencers. And this will be, you know, there'll be the next JK Rowling writing a book. And, you know, because of this shut, shut everybody down, they had time to do yep. something or, because that's the thing, being an adult, you don't have a lot of time to do what you want to do anymore. You know, you have responsibilities, house, rent, kids, whatever, and uh, you got to work. You just got to make money. Um, and while you're making money, you don't always have time to do your passion. Play the guitar, knit, so um, make costumes, uh, choreograph, or whatever your dream or passion is, gardening. Um, and this might, you know, kick somebody in the butt to go, I got nothing else to do. Maybe let's learn this, what I really want to do. And I mm -hmm. think there's going to be people in four or five years that are very successful because of the pandemic they took had the time to do something they didn't have the time to do because uh life doesn't always give you that you know have you started anything new any uh old like thoughts stuff that you passions that maybe had uh laid in dormant for a bit oh yeah pornography 
No, no. I'm totally just kidding. <laughs> uh, but uh, but no, I have not started. Yeah, that never stopped. What do you mean? No, of course. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> um, no, I mean, um, me and my girlfriend had a great time together, just hanging out. You know, we've uh, watched the new series. We worked. We started working out in the backyard together and that, doing our own thing, which is kind of fun. And then gardening. She started planting some stuff in the back just because we had the time, some tomato plants and pepper plants and sunflower seeds and all that. So my backyard looks like the back of Canada and I'm in the desert. I, I have no more dirt to plant anything because I thought, well, let's do something. But I love working out there. And we also had to make some new friends over the last couple of months, you know, that we've gone to travel with and see. And, and it's a nice time. We've, we've made, a, a, you know, probably six or eight new friends that are going to be friends for life. And they're good people. Um, so we've had the time. We've had the time to have dinners and drinks and get to know people, not just a quick hello or whatever the case is. So it's right. good. You know, when you hang out, do you uh, like I, I think of, you know, like musicians, like when, you know, as a musician or hanging out sometimes off oh, some of the guitar comes out and we'll just start jamming. Do you like is magic to that for you? Like, are you constantly doing or creating or when you guys are hanging out, are you doing does that come up as just sort of a thing to do? Yeah, sometimes, you know, I, I, yeah, of course, you know, I'll get couple calls from a few of my buddies, a buddy of mine up in Canada, he lives in Vancouver, now his name's Chris Funk, very good magician, probably one of the best in, in, in Vancouver and in uh, the States. And he'll say, hey, I got a new idea, you got time for a call? I said, yeah, and he'll FaceTime or whatever, and we'll look at the trick and play around with it, or I'll just send him a couple ideas and go, what do you think of this? I'm trying to work on this, or whatever the case is. And I, I love that, you know, just because it's kind of nice to workshop with people that are at the same level as yourself. Mm -hmm. and they can talk the lingo and, and give you some ideas, you know, or not, you know what I mean? And go, well, it's not a great idea or whatever the case is. So it's nice. Yeah, it's great to do that. Who do you look up to now as far as other magicians or is there anyone that you kind of go, man, they're doing something really good that, uh, you know, you admire or uh, are impressed by? Well, magic is not at the moment, I don't think. There's a lot of good magicians out there doing some cool TV stuff here and there and they're pushing it forward and they're all great guys. Um, you know, I, I grew up watching David Copperfield because he, he, he has the money, the time, and he's very good at what he does as a magician. You know, he's a legend. Um, but other people I look at, I think are probably actors or comedians and people like that, mm -hmm. that I look up to other than magic. You know, I think David Chappelle's great. I think what he yeah. just did with his whole George Floyd thing coming out and facing the music right in the face, which he's known for, and talking about things like that, you know. Um, so he just did a Netflix thing on that. And, and so I'm looking at different... Um, comedians and people like that uh, that I look up to you know what I mean just as entertainers in a whole you know well I mean obviously as a comedian you definitely uh, have the the gift of seeing those opportunities and appreciating it uh, definitely have enjoyed every show I've been with you is because it while some of the tricks are the same your interaction is always playing off of your environment um and that obviously is beyond magic that's a another skill set because i'm sure you've seen people who do their one thing and then when they're thrown a curveball they they don't know how to adjust um what, what's like been one of the funniest curveballs you've been thrown when you've brought someone up on stage for one of your experiences or uh calling out somebody that have you know thrown you for a loop I don't know. I'm trying to think. I mean, we've had all sorts of things happen. You know, I've had people when I'm on stage, you know, in a nice theater. And of course, they have cocktail waitresses serving drinks and that. And I remember when it was, it was a ship or a venue we played somewhere. And she had a tray full of glasses, just packed the whole front row and tables. And I'm telling you, she hit something and the whole tray went right in the middle of a joke and a bit I was doing. And the, But you had to address it. I mean, she literally jugheaded the whole thing and they went everywhere. <laughs> and now you got to clean that up too. And it's in the front row. It's not like in the back where no one can see it and you can ignore it. Right. You got to deal with it, you know. So I made a couple of jokes, you know, uh, and went on with it. And she was okay and all that stuff. And and, um, and we went on from there. But but you have those things happen. It's real life. So don't try to hide them or you deal with them directly. You know, ask her name and all this other stuff. And of course, because she slipped, you know, um, I, I got her name, whatever. I can't remember her name was um karen or something like that and like we were at some casino you know what i mean and um and i made a joke saying thanks for all being here this is the last um night of uh hard rock uh this is going to be called karen's casino now and uh, we all appreciate that so you know if you've got any uh hard rock dollars this is the night to use them so i made right. something like that the key <laughs> is just to take the time to assess assess it mm -hmm. listen don't jump right on it because you know instantly as a comedian you kind of think quickly you go, we got to make this a bit and make it take the elephant out of the room 
and then everyone has a laugh and then they get their drinks, you know, and then everything's cleaned up and we move on. And because you've accepted that, you'll have to look, oh my God, you're a genius. And no, I'm just someone that accepted it, acknowledged it, um, and tried to make it entertaining as I could and move, moved on, you know, versus some act, oh, see it happen, not a, not deal with it, and then continue and the elephant's still in the room, but they're not equipped to deal with that. You know what I mean? They are not don't know what to say or what to do. They just keep trucking on the way they're supposed to be because, you know, you get scared. You don't want to go off the tracks. You know, it was, I, I look forward to going off the tracks because you never know what you can get. Well, know. and what a brilliant life lesson that is because yeah. oftentimes people can't adjust. They don't utilize yeah. what is going on. Right. Uh, with the live stuff you do and then you do so much TV and the YouTube, what, what for you is like brings you the most joy? Um. I think walking on stage, you know what I mean, every night, you know, and, and trying a new bit, you know, or, and trying to take a risk, writing something and see if it works, you know what I mean? Kind of like going fishing, you know, you kind of pick a spot yeah. in the river or the lake, you throw a rod in and maybe you get something, maybe you don't. And when you do, it's pretty exciting. Oh my God, I knew it's a good spot to go fishing. So I think that's the way comedy works a little bit for me. I get excited about it. And, and you know, it, it may take you a week or two to have the balls to say the new joke that takes... <laughs> eight seconds, but if it gets a huge laugh, that joke's in your show for 20 years, you know, it's, it's, it's right. adding to your repertoire, it's adding to your set list, you know. Is any of your act that you have now, some of the stuff, that material that you started with? Sure, some of it's 20 years old, you know, and then the odd time you'll do a new bit adding on to it and go, my God, how did I not think of that 10 years ago? I don't know why I didn't add that into it, you know, and it's just because you just don't think like that. You get television sometimes, especially when it's your own act, because you see it every day becomes you know a little monotonous and a little you know groundhog dayish you know so so how do you keep it fresh what is your like every time you go back out on stage and and you already know you know your act which is very similar to the one you did either earlier that day or uh the day before how do you maintain the level of spontaneity and freshness and um ability for it to feel so new you walk out and you walk out um as if it is your first audience and mentally that's where you put yourself you walk out as if it's it is a new audience it's new people and it, it, the people are what makes the show you know mm. and you walk out because they're all new faces and that's what excites you they react a little different they'll laugh more or less or clap less and more and that's where it comes from and they haven't heard these and i don't really think about my jokes much i'll, I'll run it quickly so i know where they should be and i don't think about them again because i want them to come out as if i just thought of it it's not easy right. when you've done it for 20 years but Right. That's the acting of it, you know what I mean? Uh, or something that people think is just off the cuff and it's actually been your show for years. You just ignore it. And then when it happens, you try to react and then it hopefully comes out the way it looks, which is supposed to be nonchalant. You know what I mean? So it's just a matter of doing it lots. So and when you do it a lot, you kind of get used to that. And you just kind of walk out and, and you access the audience and who they are and you dress them as if it is a new audience. Because it is. They're all new faces, new people. And... Um, and you give them that quality that, that, that they're there for, you know. Do you have a favorite um, location that you've uh, ever done or a state, country? Um... I, I loved, I mean, there's so many great places, but I loved uh, playing Monte Carlo, um, Monaco, over over in the Mediterranean. You know, I was there for a month and a half. I played the casino there, the cabaret, and it was wonderful. I had a great time. I lived in Beausoleil, which is a, in France. The France and Monaco are right below each other. But I literally walked out of Monaco into France, and that's where my little apartment was, like 380 stairs of a mountain. And I loved it. You know, the, the windows open up to the Mediterranean every morning. I had my coffee there. I could see the palace to my right and the theater down by the water in front of me. Wow. It's it like being a Disney movie. Unbelievable. I had the wooden shutters and the whole bit with the flowers on my balcony and the whole bit. And it wasn't a fancy place. It was just an old, well, everything over there is fancy. It's so damn old, you know. So. Yeah. So it was cool, you know, and then my other windows in the kitchen opened to the street, literally to the street. Like when people walked by, I could tickle their ear. Like it was right there. Just like, you know, like I said, just like in the Disney movies, you know, uh, or Geppetto and Pinocchio in their little village or whatever, you know. And so I really enjoyed that, you know, and, and, and that contract, you know. And I toured a lot and I, I love Santorini, Greece, you know, when I worked over there. I didn't work in there. I worked on a cruise ship in the train. Um, and yeah, but I've worked everywhere in Vietnam, Japan, everywhere in Lebanon, you know, and all these different places have a different flair, but they're unique to that region, you know? So mm -hmm. they really are some of the coolest things because you're not going to get what you got in Lebanon in Japan, you know? And you're not going to get that in the Caribbean or Hawaii, you know? So. And do you prefer touring over having a residency? I mean, is there- you No, know, I love uh... having a residency. I love driving to work, coming to home, my dogs, girlfriend, friends, my cars, my yard and all that stuff. And we have a cat. 
Oh, I love, I love that. You know what I mean? But I love going on the road too now. You know, I went on, I went on the road years ago. It was two years at a time sometimes, you know? Oh, wow, yeah. That was fun. New friends and at Christmas, you don't know who the hell you're buying Christmas presents for because you make <laughs> new friends. Um, but now I like touring, but for a weekend or two weeks, I'll do, you know, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'll do four theaters, you know, and then fly home. Uh, I like that pace and then come home again, you know? So, um, so it's, it's, it's nice that way, you know, it's nice to enjoy your home and enjoy the home that you're working for, you know, and right. just have that, that, you know, that anchor and just enjoy your life a little bit, you know? And do you have any uh, vision for the future? Uh, uh, any like, cause it seems like, I don't know how the, the entertainment world is going to be as far as, you know, shows being open and all of that. Um, any, new ways of delivery or ways of connecting you've got your youtube obviously but do you see shifts in the industry uh yeah i see shift in the industry of course but this what's happening now over the last three months uh is reaction right now don't right. know what's real what's not we're just reacting uh and what our new normal is you know once they find a vaccine for this covid we'll be back to normal i think you know I mean, there's gonna be a lot of businesses out of work and people that lost their jobs and all that stuff because it's it's horrible um yeah. But um, we're resilient. We're humans. We, you know, we tell people smoking's bad for you. You get cancer. Yeah. And then what do they do? They go buy a pack of cigarettes. So what the hell? You know what I mean? That's who we are. We we listen, and then we do what the hell we want to do. You know what I mean? They go oh, sharks in the water. I gotta go in the water. And, you know, and the way we go in Florida, and sure enough, somebody gets bitten by a shark. You know, so we we're like that. You know, we're selfish. We're indulgent. You know, we love living. Um, and yeah, we l listen and learn a little bit, but then uh, we forget a lot too. You know, or once that is patched up we keep on trucking you know what i mean so so yeah so i you know i think there's gonna be a few changes for myself personally and then i'm gonna have to run real soon too because i got yeah, one, another meeting coming up i gotta run too doug but um this this i think with magic and and where it's at and with entertainment i think for me i'm doing more tv i have a, a tv uh, i think i'm gonna restart filming hopefully towards the end of summer um my sidekick and my comedy guest star lefty is in it mm -hmm. Um, with me and as well as my girlfriend Danny, who's the host of Crazy Girls, um, and it's it's a magic based type thing. But we have three or four countries interested, and we're hoping to produce or start producing it um, in August. You know, and hopefully we'll be out in the fall and winter. So my whole goal, which has always been, but even more so now, is more YouTube, more online, more television for me. You know, and I've just been lucky. I've been doing a lot of TV for the last twenty or thirty years. Um, I'm at the right place where I can, you know, mold right into that. You know, and, I'm not well, and you old, certainly but, made it a, a focus. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. which is important. I think uh, very instructive. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, any, uh, anything, any way that we could get in touch with you, any way that we could support you even more? Um, how could someone get in touch with you if they wanted to learn more? Um, obviously you're at the Tropicana at the moment um, and hopefully that will be starting up uh, shortly. Um, but any, any other things you'd like to share, things you're working yeah. on? Yeah, you can always see me. My website's murraymagic.com. Everything's on there. You can click on it. It'll take you wherever, you know. And my YouTube, which we do videos all the time, is uh, Magic Murray on YouTube. And then TikTok, uh, which is my newest platform. I think we just hit 400,000 followers this, today or last week. Wow, um, That's my new platform, you know, and all the kids are doing TikTok and that. But that's our newest platform. And uh, we post stuff once or twice a week on that or sometimes even daily. Um, and then, of course, this week on TV, the old square box, the old television, I'm on CW, Massive Illusion, my seventh season uh, this year, and, and I'm on this Friday uh, as one of my episodes. You can catch me at 8 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time on the CW. And, uh, and then I think I'm going to be on Hell's Kitchen this year as well. We filmed that about a year ago. And then we're just filming some more Pawn Star episodes starting in July. So I think it's going to be the 18th season or something. We're going to like 600 episodes now in Pawn Star. So. So there you go. That's where you can catch me, Doc. So thanks awesome. for having them. Well, thank you so much for sharing your most valuable asset, your time. Uh, I look forward to next time, obviously, out in uh, Vegas. I always make it a point to, to come see you and, and bring as many people as I can to uh, bask in your, ma your majestic uh, magic. Um, and uh, if there's anything that, you know, myself or any of my resources that can support you, please uh, feel free to dig in and, and uh, anything that you need, I'm, I'm at your service. I appreciate that, buddy. Anything you need, let me know. But you're always a guest of my show, you and your family and all that stuff. So uh, thank you. I appreciate, really appreciate you, brother. You. All right. Care. Love you for who you are and who you aren't. God bless. Take care. Love you, man. Bye-bye.